Good morning, Fancy Meat Computers. How's everybody doing today? I hope everybody had a good weekend. I hope that uh, we didn't have anybody succumb to the horrible, hot, and humid weather that we had yesterday, at least in, in my part of the world. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, good morning. So... I don't think I have any announcements today, aside from the fact that your lab activities start today. So just a quick reminder about how that all works. After class, after this class, which lasts for two hours, uh, during which we will not have a break so as to be able to break 10 minutes early to allow you guys to have at least 20 minutes to nuke yourself some pizza pockets before it's time for the lab time to start. Um, there will be a two-hour lab session following class today. You will be working on activity Unix basics. Uh, normally, this activity is scheduled to take you a four-hour time slot. However, we have only a two-hour time slot available. If you manage to complete the activity, fantastic. If you do not, uh, then it will be due at the date indicated in the syllabus, specifically July 5th at 10.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, yeah, in general. So, uh, with no further fuss, muss, or further ado, let's get right into our lecture material today, because we got a lot of ground to cover and not a lot of, gro not a lot of time to cover that ground in. So, <clears throat> this class is a class not only on Unix, which is what we've been covering so far, but it is also a course on C programming. You will need to know C programming for some of the courses that you're going to have to take in second year, uh, assuming you are in the computer science program, and for some of the courses that you may decide to take in second year if you are minoring in computer science. So, let's get right into it. C, the best language. So, hardware versus software. You guys probably already know this, but we'll go over it anyway. This is important for framing the idea. Hardware is a collection of physical electronical, electronic components that comprise a computer's physical form. Software is a series of instructions stored in a computer's memory that may be executed by sometimes arbitrary software systems. So we're really trying to conceptualize software as a series of instructions. Um, this is um, in when you're when you're programming in Python, you kind of get a, a uh, you get a certain flavor of my program is a series of computer instructions. However, because C as a language is much 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 closer to the actual underlying hardware, we are programming in a much lower level language now, there's going to be a much more direct uh, mental comparison to be made between the, the, the instructions that you create in a C program and that which executes on the hardware. There are fewer layers in between. Let me just, let me just uh, pop out my chat so I can see if, um, if you guys are making commentary. Let's, let's hear from the peanut gallery. Blop. There we go. I love how you can just kind of blop the windows around. It's awesome. Anyway, so a processor is a group of circuits that implant operations on memory. That is all it is. It is a thing that manipulates memory. These operations are known as instructions or hardware instructions. So each instruction that your CPU is capable of executing is a physical circuit in physical reality. Tiny, tiny thing within the context of the CPU. You know, a CPU is only about that big, but uh, these days it contains billions and billions, maybe trillions of transistors. And, you know, one of these logic circuits might be a group of, you know, maybe a few hundred transistors. So you can, you can see how many operations these CPUs support. So... Programming languages are more or less abstract depending on how directly they access a system's underlying hardware. In high-level languages, such as Python and Haskell, an operation may represent 
many hardware instructions. You, it especially comes into, um, uh, you can think of that especially in terms of uh, functional languages like, Har like Haskell. It's like, how would you implement like one function in Haskell as a series of CPU operations? It's like, you don't, you just think in Haskell. In low-level languages, such as C, an operation represents comparatively few hardware instructions. In C, uh, most of the operations that you will perform in C will, um, will uh, translate to, at most, uh, three or four hardware instructions. Um, you know, that not... Like, I'm not talking about statements here necessarily, because, you know... Uh, combining together arbitrarily long expressions is something that we can do in C, but uh, and you know the longer the expression is, obviously the long the more hardware instructions it will take to execute it. But if you're talking about simple stuff like an add operation, uh, maybe about four hardware operations. Different languages are good for different things, and a good developer knows which languages are suited to which applications. That's right, uh, you guys. I always, uh, you guys might have gotten this impression from me when I, when you took one MD3 with me, if you did take one MD3 with me, um, that my preferred way to teach stuff about computers is to teach them as tools, right? Everything is a tool in your tool belt. You know, you don't use a wrench when a screwdriver is appropriate. You don't use C when Haskell is appropriate. Um, everything has its domain of application. Uh, except for F-sharp. Ha ha ha, jokes about F-sharp. Um, <clears throat> so. So why, why would we learn a low-level language like C? Number one, applications. Again, everything has its domain of applicability. Anywhere you are programming close to the bare metal you will probably be programming in C. This includes operating systems, kernels, and the stuff you'll learn about in CompSci 2 GA3 computer architecture. So all of that operating and kernel stuff that we were talking about during the lecture, uh, the, during topic one, uh, this these are the types of applications that it's common to program in C for. Um, it's like C. You would you would use C, um, essentially, if assembly might be appropriate, but you want more support than that. You know, you want to be able to highly, highly, highly optimize your code. So that's the next point: optimization. Because they use a small number of hardware instructions per operation, programs written for low-level languages can be very, very small and run very quickly relative to high-level languages. Some optimizations are not even possible in high-level languages that you can make in low-level languages. Um, take, for example, Python. Python handles all of the memory management stuff itself, and this is fine most of the time. However, a, a uh, intelligent human designer of software will always outperform uh, a an automatic computer algorithm that writes uh, that that writes software, and that essentially is what your Python uh, your Py Python interpreter is doing, right? It is a computer algorithm that has encoded a number of the most common man manners of handling memory into itself, so that it can handle that in the background, and you don't have to worry about the memory management. Well, guess what? Surprise! It's not as efficient as it could be. Because as efficient as it could be would be using a human brain. That's right. The meat computers are better than the, uh, still better than the electronic computers so far. So, so what you can achieve with a low level language is a very high degree of optimization relative to something in a higher level language. Um, this can be along two different, um, two different uh, dimensions, essentially. You can have memory efficiency, and you can have runtime efficiency. Runtime efficiency, of course, is uh, that's that is uh, how many instructions you're executing 
multiplied by how fast your processor is. Um, the memory efficiency is a couple of things. Not only is it the memory management in your algorithm itself, but it's also the size of your algorithm. <clears throat> now, you might be thinking, surely the, surely the code itself is vanishingly small in comparison to the amount of memory that it may use. And the answer to that is, well, no, not necessarily. Um, you know, it, this, this sort of, this was more of a concern back in the day, like say during the 90s when you had platforms of extreme memory limitation. I'm, I'm thinking particularly about the Nintendo Game Boy when I say this. Like, the Game Boy had very, very little memory available, because at that in those days, memory was a, the most expensive part of a computer system. So you would have memory, uh, you would have a total amount of memory available to you that would be measured in, like, you know, some hundreds of kilobytes, right? Or something like that. So, you know, some of the most popular games in video game history fit in less than a megabyte. So, so why? Why do we need, the, need this level of optimization continuing? So, for certain applications, if you're de designing a product, right? Say you're making an IoT device. The less memory you have to put into your device, the less it's going to cost to manufacture. So, the smaller you can get your program, and the associated programs that are required to run your program, the smaller you can get that, the more memory you can shave off your production model, which means, you know, that might not be, you know, worth the effort if you're only making 10 or 100 of the thing. But let's say that you're making something, you know, th that there would be several, you know, say 10 million of these things produced. If you're saving, you know, 10 cents on a hundred mil uh, on ten million uh, things, then you have saved your company a million dollars, which pays your salary for like ten years or thereabouts. So you know, optimization still goes on. It's still very important. And when you need an optimized language, or when you need a language in which you can optimize, you go for C. Also, the, the third reason to learn C is knowledge. An appreciation for, for what our programs are doing under the hood will make us better programmers. Uh, it's impossible to call yourself a, a programmer if you don't understand the memory model, in my personal opinion. So, let's quickly review von Neumann architecture. So, von Neumann architecture is the style of architecture that's used in... It, it, it predominates in most uh, electronic devices. Uh, the only places where you see people getting away from von Neumann architecture are in things like FPGAs, which simulate circuits directly. Or they don't simulate circuits, they implement circuits. It's like reprogrammable circuitry. Um, in a FPGA, the hardware itself is reprogrammable, so you don't need a CPU. You can just program the circuits and the circuits will do the calculation. And so FPGAs have these interesting properties like true parallelism that's impossible using a central processing model of processing, um, centralized processing. So the von Neumann architecture is centralized processing. The idea is you have your inputs, you have your outputs in the course, in this course, uh, that'll be primarily standard input and standard output are what we're going to be dealing with. They're technically like internal to the computer, but that's what we're going to be seeing in the terminal, so it's good enough. The central processing unit has a control unit. This controls the uh, which statements are being executed when, and you have an arithmetic logic unit, which performs the actual calculations, and you have a memory unit inside of the computer, which the CPU interacts with. There are, of course, several different types of memory. You have register memory, cache memory, RAM, and ROM, uh, roughly speaking. So, let us speak 
about the C programming language. C evolved from two previous languages, BCPL and B. So C is the next one after B. BCPL, or Basic Combined Programming Language, was developed in 1967 by Martin Richards as a language for writing operating systems and compilers. Ken Thompson modeled many features of his B language after their counterparts in BCPL, and in 1970 he used B to create early versions of the Unix operating system at Bell Laboratories. The good old boys at Bell Laboratories. So, Dennis Ritchie, Dennis Ritchie is, uh, it's like, if there are two grandfathers of computing that are the, like, the icons in this course, it would be Dennis Ritchie and Linus Torvalds. So, Dennis Ritchie at Bell Labs created the C language as an evolution of B in 1972. C was initially... Uh, the development language of the Unix operating system. Uh, how it worked, uh, Dennis, Ritchie ori uh, Dennis originally wrote uh, Unix in assembly code. Uh, he wrote the first versions of the C compiler also in assembly code. Once he had something that could compile C, he wrote, basically, he basically rewrote the rest of the Unix operating system in C because it was so much better than assembly code. Many of today's leading operating systems are written in C and or C++. Windows, Linux, iOS, Android, and uh, OS X kernels are all written mostly in C, not even C++. C is mostly a hardware independent, so if you write a C program, uh, it can be ported to pretty much any hardware platform so long as there's a compiler. And with careful design, it's possible to write C programs that are portable to most computers. So, I mentioned C++ here, and I just wanted to, I wanted to talk about it briefly, because uh, for those of you who are in the know, C++ has a reputation for being a difficult language that is extremely useful to know if you want a job. Um, <laughs> so... We're not going to cover C++ in this class, but I can tell you a few things about C++. Uh, number one, every C program is a valid C++ program. So by teaching you C, I'm technically also teaching you C++. You're welcome. Um, essentially what C++ does is it takes a whole heck of a lot of added language features and throws them into C. Many of these added language features, um, I don't want to say overwrite or invalidate, but uh, many of the ways in which you would do things in C are uh, made obsolete by the additions to the language that are made in C++. Um, those additions uh, are things like object-oriented programming and uh, file streams and stuff like that. Um, a, an excellent way, I think, to get into C++ programming is to have first studied C programming. Because, um, you know, when you're programming in C++, you'll always have your C to fall back on if you don't know how to do something with the C++ constructs. But anyway... So, that's C++. Because of its high performance characteristics, C is still used a lot, despite being 50 years old. C as a language is older than your dad, probably, or maybe as old as your dad. Not as old as my dad, but then again, I'm older than you guys. So... The applications include operating systems, portability across many hardware implementations, and overall performance lend C to operating system development. Linux portions... Oh, I think I... Yes. I think I may have said that already. 
Anyway, lots of operating systems use C. Incidentally, Apple's OS X uses a thing called Objective-C. Objective-C is basically Apple's version of C++. It's, they took C and they did stuff with it uh, in the same way that um, C++ took C and did stuff with it. But C++ was also written by Dennis Richie, Richie's, uh, Dennis Ritchie, so the inventor of C brings you C++ as opposed to, you know, um, you know, Steve Jobs doing his own thing off in the corner like he always does. Um, so, yeah. So Apple has its own version, but generally speaking, it's C-based. Embedded systems. C is one of the most popular languages for embedded systems development, which are typically highly memory conservative. You remember me saying things about production models of, of actual products? That's where you're starting to talk about embedded systems. So, we also have real-time systems. So, real-time systems are mission-critical applications which require very, spons very fast response times. Think things like um, nuclear reactors. Uh, that's actually real-time safety critical. Um, something like, um, uh, you know, the software inside of an airplane. That's real-time safety critical. Something that's real-time but not safety critical would be something like um, video streaming, right? It matters that your program is hitting the correct deadlines, but nobody's life is ex at stake if they, uh, if they have you know, have to endure buffering on, you know, the 20th cute cat video that they've watched in three hours because they're procrastinating and not doing their homework. <clears throat> Communication systems. Due to the mass massive quantities of data being routed, optimizations become crucial. So, uh, and I guess that comes into video streaming as well, but if so you, you you start running into situations where you need these operations when you need to optimize again runtime or memory the more memory you have to process the more efficiently you should do it which means c so <clears throat> this is as of may 2021 c <sighs> pardon me C is the most popular programming language, according to the Tyobi Index. Now, what the Tyobi Index actually measures is Google searches for how to do stuff in various languages. So, what it is not, it is not necessarily a measurement of how popular some a language is in terms of uh, actual use in industry, shall we say, but uh, how much people are learning it, right? because Google searches for how to program something are correlated to the number of people who are trying to learn it, not the number of people who are using it in an industrial setting. Although, you know, one would think that uh, the number of students, it, like, the, the, one would hope that the number of students relative to the number of software developers wouldn't be a huge number. But, you know, at any rate, this light blue line here is C. So you can see for a while Java was the most popular programming language until, you know, uh, really um, uh, it, it took a nosedive in 2020 for whatever reason. But Java has been a very popular programming language for a long time. C has pulled ahead. Yay, C. And you can see this black line here. That's Python. So Python has been has been really creeping up since 2018 and is now one of the more popular programming languages. Um, probably because, you know, around 2010, they started teaching it in first-year programs. You know, it takes about that long for things to uh, get out into the populace. But yeah, and you can see C++ was at one point much more popular. It's now uh, given up. You can see that there's kind of an inverse correlation between C++ and Python. As Python goes up, C++ goes down. How did pop Python become so popular so quickly? I generally think that there was a conspiracy. <laughs> uh, basically, um, for whatever reason, 
a lot of um a lot of like university and um college programs began to adopt python as the first language that you learn i don't know if there was like a conference or something but you know python python does have certain advantages with when you're when you're learning it when you're first learning a programming language like the the syntax is reasonably simple right and people some people sort of tend to settle on one programming language they know one programming language and then they do everything in that programming language right um that's not uncommon especially among people who are like like python is being used a lot by people who are not necessarily programmers right like if you see grad students in um you know the science faculty or something like that they'll often be using python and because they're um you know uh, not programmers. They have more questions about the programming that they're doing, so they'll ask more on Google, which probably, you know, shoots up the Tyobi index. But yeah, um, I think I think it's primarily attributable to the fact they started teaching it in schools. Um, back in my day, when I took one D O four, um, back when back before they had done this um, this homogenization of the engineering first year curriculum. Um, <clears throat> 1D04 was done by the CAS faculty. Um, I believe I had Dr. Wassing for it. And we did C-sharp, actually, for our first programming language. Which, you know, was fine. I had, uh, a like, I didn't know much programming. I had kind of come from a, uh, a background in ac Flash Action Script, which is kind of a clone of JavaScript. So, you know, JavaScript and uh, C Sharp, they weren't a million miles off of each other. I kind of knew what I was doing, so that was fine. But yeah, they, they teach Python now, so that's why Python is becoming popular. Um, but yeah, some of the interesting ones, like you would never have thought that Visual Basic was that popular, you know, <laughs> at any point, uh, given its current performance. You can see assembly languages even on this. Um, but, you know, assembly, again, this is probably primarily because people are looking for how to do it in school. Or wait, no, no, that's not Visual Basic, that's PHP. V VB is right here. Yeah, that's uh, that's PHP. So PHP was an extremely popular web language through the uh, the 20, the, the, the naughties, I guess we call them. Uh, C Sharp had its rise and its fall. JavaScript has been, you know, sort of baseline this entire time. JavaScript's actually one of the most used programming languages. It's just everybody who uses it already knows how it works, so they don't have to Google it. <laughs> anyway, so let's talk about the standards. Oh, I have another question. Uh, do you think that Python is going to overtake everything, or do you think that the others will make a comeback? Um, so... I do not believe, uh, I do not believe that there is an empire in the world that will not fall. Uh, eventually, given enough time, and I, I think the same thing about programming languages. So, you know, Python looks like it's getting popular. Yeah, yeah. Why would they make those two colors too similar? Yeah, it's it's terrible, right? Um, so. Python looks like it's going to, like, all, like this is deceptive, right? Python looks like it's going to overtake everything, but it's not because it's terribly designed for object-oriented programming. If you're going to do proper object-oriented programming, you should be using almost anything else. Like, um, you should be using Java or C++. I'm sorry... Java and C++ are far, far superior in the manner in which they handle object-oriented programming to Python. The problem with Python is it's too loose. It's too dynamic. You've got too much going on with, like, you can, you can assign attributes to an object from outside of that object. It doesn't make any sense. I don't know why they did it that way, except everything in Python is, like... 
working with Python is like trying to mold something out of Jello, uh, or like not Jello, like some kind of very viscous substance that keeps running through your fingers as you're trying to as you're trying to pat it into some kind of shape. At least with C++, when you say, I want you to have these variables, they need to be private, these ones need to be public, those are the variables you get. You can't, like, Python is way too open to exploitation by malicious people. As I find, found out with the uh, test cases for 1MD3 the one year, or the one semester. In the fall this year, actually, somebody, somebody figured out a clever way... Um, to break the uh, break the test cases that we use for the Jupyter notebooks for um, for one day one MD three for testing stuff stuff that what they did was they wrote a class which overloads equality to always return true and then all they had to do was return an instance of that class I would like when the test case tries to compare the instance of that class with anything it would always come out true if you were testing for equality because equality has been overloaded to always return true for that class, and that broke every test case, almost every test case. And it was like six lines of Python. You would never get away with that shit in C++. Anyway, so yeah, um, Python will be very popular for a while until something better comes around, and then Python will go back down again. That's how that. That's how everything works. However, the operating system is written in C. So, <laughs> what did we do about it? Yeah, that's. Uh, so to fix this problem, what we did is we um, we uh, we wrote a uh, we wrote a um, a function that tests the equality internally, but it checks to make sure that the uh, the default definition of equality is being used, and. Uh, we include a security code in the name of the function, which is, um, it's long enough to not be guessable, right? So, um, and, you know, so this this uh, series of randomized characters inside of the function name means they can't just overload that function uh, to also return the correct equality that they want. So, uh, yeah, so we, we, we had to develop active countermeasures. Uh, <laughs> You know what the worst part is? Um, well, there are two worst parts. One, the guy didn't mean anything by it. He was just, like, scientifically curious to see if that was possible. And number two, he published it publicly, saying, Hey, guys, I think I broke the auto grader. And it's like, no, please! But hey, if the guy ever wants a TA position. Woof. Uh, anyway. So. <clears throat> so let's talk about standards. So, the semantics of the C language are set by the International Standards Organization, ISO, and the International Electrotechnical Commission, IEC, in a series of standard documents. So, the most recent of which is C17. Uh, basically, it's just C followed by the, uh, the year in which the, uh, the standard was released. So, this is C2017. Um, it w not going to read the number. If you want to look up the C standard, you can. Um, this is the latest version. So, although it was started in 2017, it was published in 2018, so, you know. There are many C compilers, which are all implementations of this standard, to varying degrees. The, uh, the following compilers are compliant with the latest version of the standard. So, there are only three that are, uh, there are only three, uh, C compilers that are, uh, current to the standard that was released three years ago. One is GCC, the other is Clang, and the other is Ewarm. So because we are doing Linux, this is a class in Unix slash Linux, um, we will be using the GNU compiler collection, which is C uh, GCC. GCC is your homeboy. GCC. Ta-da, fatal error. Uh, GC, man, GCC. There we go. GNU, Project, C, and C++ compiler. So, just a quick, um, you know, 
if you think you're going to be clever and write a C++ program and then try to feed it into C GCC because it says it can take it, it can't. In order to uh, compile a C++ program, do G++. That is the, um, that's the way that you do um, a C, you, that's the way you specify a C, the C++ mode on GCC. So, yeah. Yeah, it was clever. It was obnoxiously clever. I, I tell ya, we were... I was gonna use a... I was going to use a naughty phrase. So, anyway, um... So, you may not be, like, familiar with this process of how, um... How companies come to these types of things. This is an older software development model uh, than the sort of current popular one, which is open source, right? So the idea is you have a standards document. And you have a bunch of different software vendors. These software vendors purchase the right to it to produce a implementation of the standard. If it's a closed standard, if it's an open standard, they can just make one. Um, so they make their compilers, right? their compiler is going to comply with the standard to various degrees. And the standards organization's responsibility is ensuring that the standards that these people, or the, uh, the compilers that these people are making adhere to the standard, right? They have to test it to make sure it adheres to the standard. <coughs> this is why GCC is compliant, and Windows, uh, the C compiler that Windows uses, is not. That's right, folks. Uh, the C compiler that Windows uses is not compliant with the C standard. Which is why you need to be using the GC... This is why you need to be doing your C programming in Linux for this class. If you don't have a Linux machine, you can always log in to... the server. Um, so... So everyone... So a whole bunch of these different companies comes up with their own version of the of the compiler they um, they get it evaluated to see if it's comp compliant or not with the standard uh, and those that are evaluated compliant of which there are a vanishingly small number um, those are stamped you know uh, C standard compliant which is you know it's a marketing thing. After that, it's like the free market takes over. All of these companies are all trying to market their own C compilers. Um, you know, Windows, the only reason the Windows C compiler is as popular as it is is because it's, you know, Windows requires itself to use it, right? And Windows is a reasonably popular operating system. Um, all, like, my God, if they ever sold a laptop where that didn't have an operating system installed on it, you know? But, you know, that's the thing about Windows. Could I please explain what blog? Blog? I don't know. Um, I'm generally not, uh, uh, generally speaking, I'm not going to follow. If you tried to uh, post a, a link there, the chat will prevent you from posting links. Um, send me an email with it in it. I'm not going to click random links that people send me during stream just because it would be too easy to troll me. Um, but yeah. Um, I, I'll take a look at it. Maybe I'll provide commentary during tomorrow's lecture. Hey, eh? um, so anyway, so the C, the C standard library, because it laps, lacks object oriented structures, the fundamental unit of abstraction in C is the function. So C does not have object-oriented. It is a purely imperative language. There's no object-oriented in it. The most commonly used functions are collected into the C standard library. Oh, oh, the blog I posted on Avenue. Oh, 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 oh. Yes, 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 yes. Actually, that I should do. Yeah. Um, okay. Okay. Let me finish the slide, then I'll talk about it, okay? So, um, so the most commonly used functions are collected into the C standard library. 
um, where Python gives you a bunch of objects, a bunch of classes, C gives you a bunch of functions. Documentation may be found at this address. Use of the library functions is strongly encouraged. Use library functions whenever possible. Library functions, especially from more venerable libraries, have had decades of optimization and improvement. Some of these guys go all the way back to the original, right? Some of these some of these libraries go all the way back to the original implementations of Unix that uh, Ritchie developed at Bell Labs. Rule number one, if a library exists, use it. Rule number two, rule, learn rule number one quickly. All right, yes. So let me just, uh, let me just pull up that announcement. So, doop -a -doop -a -doop. there we go. Um, so, this just has to, um, this isn't like a super, it's a, I, I, like I, I, I've gone through this process and it's actually quite easy, but the idea here, the problem that we're having here, um, it used to be that you could just use the, the password that you designed with, uh, with your GitHub account to access your Git materials if you wanted to clone them to your local repos like to a local version of your repository. So if you went like git clone and then you had some HTTP address that corresponded to your um, to your GitHub repository that you wanted to clone, which is something that you're going to have to do, so should, you should learn how to do it. Um, you used to just ha be able to use your username and password to authenticate that access. What they're doing now is they're, they're stepping things up. They're now requiring two-factor authentication on GitHub accounts, which means that you have to generate an authentication token. It's very easy to do. Um, there's a blog post, like there's a link to instructions here. Um, where is it? Personal access token, maybe? Yeah, so creating a personal access token. Just go through this, go through the instructions here, and um, get your personal access token. You put the token in where you would put your password in, and uh, then, you know, everything works out. I would also recommend looking up how to store your credentials uh, using Git. It stores them in plain text, so they anybody who breaks into your computer can can see and steal also your GitHub account credentials. Um, so you know if you don't if you're not comfortable with that level of security, then fine. You can write out this uh, you know 24 digit random sequence of uh, numbers and letters on a piece of paper. Keep that beside your computer and then type it in each time you want to push something. Sure. You can do it that way too, uh, but yeah. So, yeah, uh, you just need to you just need a token. You need a token authentication now instead of uh, well, technically speaking, you won't need it before the end of the course. But of course, I'm not teaching you this so that you can forget all about it once the course is done. So hypothetically, you should keep your GitHub accounts that you're making, and you should use them for your pro software projects and stuff because this is a really good way to organize your development of everything but um yeah. yeah that's that's how that works basically they just changed the way they wanted to do stuff so uh, i noticed that when i was cloning the scripts in our repo yeah yeah exactly yeah you just you know they just want to increase the security and that's you know fair enough so anyway, we're going to talk for a little bit about C-based languages. Um, I know we're talking a lot about like introduction and motivation type stuff for C right now. Um, we're going to get into like the rest of it. Um, like we're going to talk about the actual language if we finish early today and starting tomorrow. So don't all log off at once. Installed it in a virtual environment. I'm not sure, quite sure how in virtual environments really work. Um, so generally speaking, what a VM is, 
is it's a it's an emulation of an operating system. So you have a um you know you have a process running on your operating system that is pretending to be a computer and then uh it'll because it's pretending to be a computer it allows um another version it allows another operating system to run inside of itself it's kind of it's there's there's not a there's not a million miles of difference between um uh, between a virtual machine and a Super Nintendo emulator. You can even do very similar things like take snapshots. Yeah. Uh, anyway. So, C++. C has been extremely influential on the development of many programming languages. Perhaps C++, most obviously. Yeah, so if you think back to the first lecture that we had, uh, you remember I was saying the development of C... Uh, in combination with the development of Unix, was, like, suddenly everybody could write everything for anyone, right? It universalized programs. Whereas before that, um, trying to write a program that was executable on anybody's machine, that was impossible because you had to have everybody's machine, right? And program the program for each one of those machines. Now that we have something that is compatible across different hardware setups, now we can now we can really start cooking with gas. So, um, and you can you can like just think, just think what life would be like if you were writing a phone app and you had to test and implement your 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 program on every single version of every manufacturer's phone, right? It would be impossible. That's where that's the level that we're talking here. So, C++ was developed by Bjarn Stolstrup at Bell Labs. Oh, I believe it. I believe Dennis was involved in the project, though. Um, it is an in iterative improvement on C, crucially adding support for object-oriented programming, which C does not have at all. Object-oriented design adds the object, a new unit of abstraction that allows the combination of data with functions. Uh, I've actually, uh, since teaching 2MP3, uh, uh, I've kind of adopted the C++ lingo with respect to classes and applied them to Python in sort of in spite of the way that Python wishes to be referred to itself. Like, it just makes more sense to refer to... Um, Arrive, uh, derived and base classes, as opposed to you know that which is inheriting and that which in that which is being inherited. Derived, base, very simple. So the increased modular modularization uh, facilitates programming principles, which allow very large programs to still be manageable. So in C plus plus you can have some pretty monstrous programs. We will not be studying C++ in this course, but it's, you know, having done this course, C++ should be that much easier for you to pick up in the future, and I highly recommend doing so because it's a very employable language, because it's difficult. Uh, that's the thing about being employable, is in order to get a job, you need to be able to do difficult things that nobody else wants to do and not complain about it. Like, teach this course. Wah! Um, <laughs> so, here's some other C-based languages. Objective-C. An object-oriented language developed in the early 80s and eventually acquired by Apple. So, Apple didn't invent it. They, ju they just bought it out and incorporated it, just like everything else that's a value that Apple did. Uh, <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm, kid I'm kidding, Apple users. I'm kidding. Um, Java is a C++-derived language developed by Sun Microsystems in 1991. It uses the Java Virtual Machine to extend portability to a massive number of highly diverse systems and architectures. Also, Minecraft is written in Java. C++, or C Sharp. So Microsoft's .NET framework integrates network connectivity into the frame, a framework of both Java and C++. Non-Microsoft implementations of C-sharp also exist, such as the game object scripting in the Unity game engine. So C-sharp is derived. So you can see 
so to speak, that pretty much all of the popular big languages are C-based, right? PHP is C-based, an object-oriented open source scripting language used primarily in internet database and internet database applications. Python, released in 1991, so the same year as Java, and developed by Guido Van Rossum. Python emphasizes the elimination of superfluous syntactic detail and has become a very popular language for introductory programming courses. And of course, JavaScript, the most widely used scripting language, adds dynamic behavior to web pages. So, C++, Objective-C, Java, C Sharp, PHP, Python, and JavaScript. And these are just the most popular ones. Uh, here is a comic, Java is to JavaScript as car is to carpet, because a lot of people don't understand that Java and JavaScript don't have much to do with each other. If you want to read that, you can pause the video. So, let's, let's talk then. So we've talked a lot. Let's learn how to compile. Let's, let's do this. This is how you compile a C program. So... In contrast to the Python that we all know and love from 1MD3, or 1D04 if you took 1D04 instead, C is a compiled rather than in, an interpreted language. So it's compiled, not interpreted. Python is interpreted, C is compiled. The process is as follows. This is how you produce a C program. Editing, pre-processing, Parsing, assembly, linking, loading, and executing. Uh, they, these are, uh, a number of these steps are uh, collected into single operations. Like uh, pre-processing, parsing, and assembly, that's all something that you, that's all something you do when you invoke the compiler. Linking, loading, and executing, that's what you do when you call the, when you, when you try to run the executable. Oh, question. Why are some languages strictly compiled? Could you not make both an interpreter and a compiler to get the benefits of both? So it depends on how the language is constructed, right? So, um, <clears throat> so, interpreter, interpreters are, um, all that it really means to say that a language has a has an interpreter is to say that there is another program in which your program is executing, right? Um, a compiled language is running on the bare metal of the CPU, right? When you compile a, a, a program, you compile it directly into machine code. Machine code as distinct from assembly code. Assembly is a language that also gets compiled to machine code. Right? Machine code is what the machine is actually what the what the machine instructions are. Right? So are there C interpreters? Uh, yes. There are C interpreters. Um, Python tutor. So uh, for any of you who took one MD3 with me recently, I've started using uh, Python tutor a lot to uh, visualize the execution of programs. So the C tutor, it has it does a C tutor as well. Um print f hello world. <clears throat> so this would be an interpreter for C. Right? Because all of this business where you can step through the program and do extended functionality, those are things that are provided by the interpreter. Um, this is an interpreter. So yeah, C, C language interpreters do exist. Um, but when you're talking about C, the interpreter would be like primarily for the benefit of learning the, like, or learning the thing. The whole advantage of C is that you're running on the bare metal right? You don't need anything. You don't need no stinking interpreter 
telling you how to do your memory management. You can just do it because you're amazing and you know how memory management works. Um, a lot of the advantage that's wrapped up in using a language like C that's very low level is the fact that you don't have that excess baggage of an interpreter. So while running it inside of an interpreter is useful if you're going to get extra information, um, generally speaking, there's a reason that GCC is the most common way to compile a C program. You know? Um, you just... You just... Uh, yeah. Running it in, into, in, running it in an interpreter doesn't have the advantages that you might think it does. Um, <clears throat> but yeah. Some languages are... Uh, so... Yeah. It's like... All that, all that strictly compiled means is that um, the interpreters that exist weren't written by the people who wrote the compiler, right? Because every major language is going to have interpreters, regardless of whether they're strictly compiled or not, including assembly. Uh, in fact, when I teach... Yeah, good. Uh, when I teach uh, assembly, when I do 2MP3... Um, rather than go through all of the rigmarole of compiling assembly for, you know, anything, we run our assembly code inside of an interpreter um, because that's good enough. And getting compi getting assembly code to actually compile is a lot harder than it sounds. But anyway, so this is how you write a C program. Number one, C files may be edited using any text editor. Common text editors include, in Windows, Notepad or Notepad++. In Linux, you're talking Emacs, Getit, or Vim. And in Macintosh, you're talking Text Edit. So, Emacs. Um, let me... No, no, no. Let me see. Code. Uh, McDeer, Topic 3. Uh, CD, Topic 3. And Emacs example.c. So this is our first C programming, guys. Whew. Hashtag include. It's act actually Octothorpe. Stdio.h. That includes, um, that gives you the ability to print. So standard IO. You can print stuff, you can work with files. Um, int main, everything in a C program has to execute inside of main, so there's a main function, and inside that main function, uh, that's where execution starts and stops. Anything, out, anything outside of main has to be called by main or something that is called by main um, in order to actually be executed. So print f, Hello, world. There we go. And we can return exodus, exit status zero. There we go. Very simple pro... See, can I blow that up? I feel like I should blow that up. Um, options. Um... Text properties. Hmm. This is worth the time, right? You got that's. I imagine this is probably very, very. Uh... Yeah, you know what? Fine. We'll save that up. We'll open it on something that's easier. Emacs is superior, but we'll use get it for now. There we go. That's better, right? There we go. So, anyway. So we have our C file. Fancier environments, such as uh, Jupyter and VS Code, allow for compilation and execution of C programs within the editor, it's editor itself. Uh, Jupyter, of course, doesn't really work very well with C. Um, the C 
kernel for Jupyter that you can download doesn't really make, it doesn't do very well. So if you're using VS Code, don't use Linux because that's how this course works. <clears throat> if this were just a course on C programming, I wouldn't care how you compiled your C code, you know, assuming that it would still run by, assuming it was still runnable by GCC, that was the, like, that, that was the, that was the restriction. Because, like, again, VS Code is using Windows, the Windows C compiler, and the Windows C compiler isn't compliant with the C standard, like GCC is, so it's possible to write a C program in Windows that doesn't compile in GCC, absolutely, although not if you stick to the basic constructs, but, uh, but yeah, anyway, so VS Code will allow you to execute stuff within the editor itself. C files are given the .c file extension. Header files, we'll get to header files, have the .h file extension. You'll notice stdio.h, 8.h means header file, so this is still a C program. When I try to make a directory, I get make dear cannot create directory topic for permission to die. Where are you trying to create it? Sounds like you're trying to create it outside of your user space. So do this. Um, do cd uh, tilde. That'll take you to your home directory. Once you're in your home directory, you have write permissions. <laughs> Sounded like you were in root or something. So. This, so, the following program describes, uh, the following process describes compiling a C program from the command line in a Linux-like environment. Let's examine the following C file. This is exactly what I have written. Invoking the C compiler. To compile this program, we use the following command in bash. GCC, simp uh, well, I used example.c, and, oh, uh, dash O, so output flag, and then the name of the executable. So, uh, yay, it works, you see? Uh, incidentally, you could have created that, um, here's a Linux tip for you guys. You could have created that directory, but what you needed to do was preface the command with sudo. Sudo stands for super user do. Um, so when you, when it's telling you you don't have permission to do something, um, if you use sudo and then provide it your administrator password, if you have one, if you're on the server, you don't have sudo privileges because of course you don't. Um, if you provide it your, like if you're on your own machine and you, uh, use, you invoke super user to execute a command, then you can do all kinds of things like delete your operating system. Um, but, um... Generally speaking, like if you go to um, uh, if you go to root, right? You Tuesday's lab is about this, but if you go to root, this is like your operating system files, right? And you can look, but you can't touch, basically. So if I go to bin, right? These are all the binary files, and you'll see there are all kinds of um, there are all kinds of programs that you've seen me use in here, like uh, make deer, for instance. So uh, slash bin is where they keep uh, make directory the the file the, the 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 executable right so you can look but you can't touch unless you invoke pseudo privileges in which uh, when you invoke pseudo privileges you can touch and you can look so if you want you can you know delete all of these programs and then you can't create folders anymore um, so yeah anyway super user um, yeah. Also, another quick tip, if you want to cancel anything at any point, control C. Control C will cancel anything that's happening, including a C file that you've written that's in an infinite loop. That's, that's terminal interrupt. So, anyway. So if we want, uh, let me just, uh, where are we here? Yes. So let's compile this program. GCC. Example dot C out example 
So you can see, so to speak, we have the example binary file. In my computer, binaries are, are in green text. Folders are blue, bin uh, binaries are green. I think that's pretty much universal if you're using something in the Ubuntu family. Um, so that means that we can execute it. The way that you execute something is dot slash, and then the name of the thing you want to execute. Hello world. There it is. You can see we forgot to add a new line. So let's just add that in. New line. There we go. Compiler and runner. There we go. Hello world. <clears throat> so the, yes, where are we here? Yeah. First, we invoke GCC, the GNU compiler collection. GCC knows we want to interpret the file as a C program because of the file extension. So it's important that things have the correct file extension. Next, we specify the file to be compiled. This guy. The O flag allows us to specify the name of the produced executable file. Lowercase o is output, uppercase o is optimization. Use little o for now. The, produ the produced file is the original program expressed in machine language, also known as object code. Note that this is different from assembly language. Object code is different from assembly language. Asse assembly language also compiles to object code. In fact, ha, here's something for you. Let's see what it looks like. Cat example. So this is what a uh, this is what an executable looks like on the inside. <clears throat> Fun, right? Oh, and clear doesn't erase everything. It just puts the terminal to the top of the window so it looks pretty. So, so let's t so what is a, what is this compiler doing? Once the compiler is invoked, it goes through a couple of stages. The first stage, aptly enough, is pre-processing. The purpose of pre pre-processing is to make the code ready for parsing and generation. The first thing you do is you remove all comments. So it just scans through the, through the file, removes all the comments. It, any macros that have been um, defined get expanded out. We'll talk about macros. Any included code gets expanded. So include in C is equivalent to import in Python. So any definitions that you need, uh, all of these things get fleshed out. Technically, include is also a preprocessor uh, command. And there are a few other things besides that we don't need to get into. Parsing is the process of breaking the code down into tokens. This is also known as tokenization. The tokens are arranged into an hierarchical abstract syntax tree. So I'll show you how this works very quickly. So there we go. So it would do something like function main, then, you know, statement, function call, print f with args hello world you know it would uh, it would break the program down right it would break the program down according to its contents store it in a sort of more abstract form that you can then generate instructions for so the idea is once you have the abstract syntax tree you then go to assembly. 
So the abstract syntax tree is used to create a series of machine code instructions which are saved as an object file. So the purpose of breaking something down into an abstract, abstract syntax tree is that you can perform manipulations of the abstract syntax tree um, in order to produce the object code. It's like if you've got if you've got like um, you know eight plus six, right? That can be broken down into object code. But if it's you know if it's in it, inside of a giant expression, you know ten minus that divided by four times two one, uh, two, you know, in order to have the um, in order to have the machine code for this expression. You have to take this giant thing and you have to break it down into its tree structure, right? So it's like um, division division of this is this would be subtraction of you know ten and uh, addition of, am I blowing your minds right now? I hope I'm blowing your minds right now, right? So this is like, et cetera, et cetera. This is how the computer breaks it down so that it can say, okay, I've got eight plus six. I can convert that to machine code, right? And it just, it starts at the bottom and it works its way up. I know about this kind of stuff because uh, for my uh, doctoral research, I've been making a compiler for a, for a hardware language. So, <clears throat> once the uh, object file has been linked up with the relevant executables, or uh, with the relevant libraries, an executable is produced. So, parsing assembly linking this is this in blue block of vision but I've already talked about it so compiler complaints your invocation of GCC may not end successfully if your code has bugs in it syntax errors occur during parsing if the code cannot be parsed correctly so for example, forgetting a semicolon causes a syntax error. Very quickly, apple. Errors. Apple undeclared. First use of in this in function. Also, expected semicolon. So that's a syntax error. What syntax error means generally is that the code does not comply with the grammar of the language. So it's like making a grammatical mistake in English, except it's much like human beings are much more forgiving of grammatical mistakes than computers are. Um, so yeah. So syntax errors are generated by the parsing process. If the, if the code cannot be broken down into the abstract syntax tree in the manner that the compiler expects it to be able to, um, that constitutes a syntax error. Um, compiler warnings do not halt execution of the comp compiler, but they can indicate other problems with your code. Some warnings are not shown by default. Use the w all, uh, warnings all flag to tell GCC you want to see them. So, um, w all. Maybe I can improve, maybe I can uh, disimprove my code. Nope, okay. Um, int f um, int x um, print f D X F three. There we go. Yeah, warning. K 
control reaches end of non-void function. So, interestingly, so the way that things work in C, you have to declare what the data type of the function is, uh, what the return type of the function is up front, right? So this is int, right? So this function needs to return an integer. This function is not returning an integer. Rather than that being a compiler error, as it would be in some other languages, in C, that is just a warning. So when you're, when you're programming in C, pay attention to your warnings. It is, if you're programming correctly, you will not get any warnings. There are some languages that'll throw a million warnings at you. Um, they'll just they'll just dump warnings at you. You'll get like 200 warnings, and it's like, how am I gonna go through all these warnings? And it's like, you're not. So just don't, you know, the program will work. Don't worry, it'll be fine. C is not like that. Pay attention to your warnings. So, if you don't want to see any warnings, which is not recommended, use the W flag. You may be warned about using data types and pointers incorrectly, not using variables that have been declared. That one's like not as much of a problem, of course. Using equals sign instead of double equals sign for equality comparison. So it's actually possible to perform in a, an assignment operation within an if statement in C if you use the wrong equal sign. In Python, they'll, they'll make that into an error. But in C, it's like, well, I'm going to warn you because I'm a little, I think that's a little sus, but I'm going to trust you know what you're doing. This is like the attitude that C takes towards all of its programmers. I'm going to trust you that you know what you're doing. Who am I to say that that's not what you meant? That's what C says to all of its programmers. And of course, that's great if you do know what you're doing, but if you don't know what you're doing, eh. <laughs> So anyway, in a Linux-like environment, an executable is run using the following command, dot slash, then the name of the executable. Loading. The compiled C program is loaded into the system's primary memory, usually the RAM. And then, execution. The CPU runs the program, starting with the first instruction and proceeding until the program terminates. So this is how you run a program. It loads it into the memory, and then it runs it. Exactly. When runtime isn't fun time. Often, your code will contain bugs, despite being compiled and linked successfully. The absence of syntax errors does not indicate a correct program. <clears throat> These are known as semantic. <sighs> Pardon me. These are known as semantic errors. Some semantic errors will just straight up crash your program. These are known as fatal errors. Dividing by zero is a fatal error. Trying to access memory that doesn't belong to you, that is the dreaded seg fault, is a fatal error. A seg fault will crash your program. We will talk about segmentation faults. Basically, um, the operating system gives you a certain amount of memory that's like, okay, kid, go nuts. Here's your playground. Here's your sandbox. Go nuts. And then if you, as the child, try to, um, you know, try to try to do anything in, uh, you know, your your neighbor's sandbox, uh, you know, like scoop the sand or whatever, um, the operating system, which in this metaphor is an extremely strict granny slaps your wrist and says, that's it, no more sandbox for you, picks you up and takes you and puts you in timeout. That's what happens when you do a seg fault. Except the sandboxes are areas of memory in the CPU, or not the CPU, in the computer system in general. <clears throat> so, others just cause a mismatch between the expected output of a program and its actual output. Um, so, you know, just because an error doesn't cause the program to crash doesn't mean it's not an error. It is important to know what the expected result of a program is for specific, specific inputs. This is the idea of testing. <clears throat> In order to test a program, you need inputs and what you want the output to look like. 
Running a program with specific inputs and looking for a known correct output is known as testing. Test early, test often. If we wish to interact with a CPU pro or a C program using a monitor and keyboard, which you probably will want to, that um, C needs to inter um, C needs to interact with the following: standard input, standard output, and standard error. STD in is the standard input stream. This is the place your computer in your computer where keystrokes are logged for retrieval by programs. So. Um, like my terminal right here. This terminal is waiting for input. When I type, when I hit a button on my computer, this uh, K button that I press on the computer sends a signal to the operating system. The operating system stores K in a file called standard input. The terminal is re uh, at a certain refresh rate reading the stuff that's in standard input and seeing if there's anything new in there. And when there is, it puts it there, right? That's what this shell does. It says, I am the active window. I am the active shell. All standard input shall be redire redirected to me so long as I exist or so long as I have not been minimized. And so <clears throat> that's why when you press the letter K, it shows up in one of your terminals and not all of them because only one terminal gets access to standard input at a time. So there you go. You also have standard output, the standard output stream. This is a place which collects things programs wish to print to the screen. Everything in here has been written to standard output. A terminal is a view of standard output, period. We're not going to get into how the monitor actually displays these terminals. That's a different thing. But everything in here has been put in standard output either by a function or, or uh, by a program that I have invoked or by Bash itself. So Bash is also dumping things into standard output and taking things from standard input. <clears throat> standard error. The standard error stream is very similar to standard output, but it's reserved specifically for error messages. All three of these streams are either emulated or connected in a more complex manner in environments such as VS Code, but are used directly in bash style environments. So VS Code is going to spoof standard output and standard input for you. Uh, when you're working in Linux and you're working on a bash prompt, you don't have to spoof it, you just have it. Um, it just works. So there you go. All right, last slide comic. I know we're a little bit early, so I'm going to get started on the next topic. Then you need to invoke the compiler and what's a compiler? Well, in this case, a compiler translates source code into object code, which is then passed to a linker, which turns into machine code. Wait, what's machine code? Machine code is the code that can be directly executed by the CPU of the... What's a CPU? The CPU is the microprocessor that... What's a microprocessor? Ten minutes later. So the positive charge attracts electrons from P-type silicon that separates the... What's, a, what's an electron? Thirty minutes later. So according to this theory, electroweak electro symmetry breaking occurs at about 100 GeV. What's a GeV? So, yeah. I have had exactly this conversation with various people in, at various points in my life. This comic feels me. So I, I guess uh, while I'm loading up the next slide deck, if you guys wouldn't mind giving me your um, questions, if you have any. We haven't really talked about anything yet, aside from compiling. So, well, I mean, you know, we talked about a lot of stuff. Hopefully you guys know what C is now. But we haven't talked about, like, the, the nitty-gritty, you know?
What is a GEV? I don't know. Giga electron volts? I don't know. That's a good question. Google. Uh, what is a GEV? Electron volt. Yeah, it's an electron volt. I was super close to being correct. Um, <clears throat> so, anyway, I just noticed, like, during stream, I do a lot of, like, violent motions. So it's like, we're learning C plus violence. It's okay. We should have a little bit of excitement in our lives, right? So, let's see here. So, we have about uh, 15 minutes left in class, so let's see if we can make some progress on basic constructs in C. So now we're actually going to learn the C language. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, so. This is our simple sample program that we've already been talking about. A really simple program in C. The main function works uh, the main function begins program execution. End of main function. Yes. So, comment your code or else. So in Python, the octothorpe character designates single line comments. In C plus or C plus plus in C plus plus and C, double slash is used. Double slash. Double slash. Double slash. Double slash is better than Octothorpe, because you don't need to hold shift. And honestly, who, who among you can uh, can hit um, Octothorpe, the Octothorpe character without looking at their keyboard? I challenge thee. So one thing that C has that Python kind of doesn't really have, but kind of does, um, multi-line comments. So in... Python, if you want a multi-line comment, um, you have to do like three quote marks, and it's automatically linked up to the documentation of whatever function that you're, like it, it serves as, uh, you know, if you call help, it'll show you the, the doc string. And that's the way that you can do multi-line comments. In C, you can just do them. You don't have to worry about anything. This is a multi-line comment that I'm doing right here. It's slash star and then star slash to end it. Anything between gets removed. You can do these midline. So um, as long as it's not in a string quote thing. There. It has to not be in the middle of an identifier, of course. Um, <clears throat> Hello! And that still compiles. So um, so yeah, they're, they're not just multi-line comments, they're also mid-line comments. <clears throat> yeah. Um, where did this go? There we go. Burp. There we go. So, here are some guidelines for commenting your code in C. At the top of your file, it's good to indicate your auth the author, the date the program was created, the date the program was last modified, and the purpose of the program. Um, this is the type of stuff that you typically see. Um, it's also the kind of stuff when... Um, it's the kind of stuff that you'll see when... Um, yeah, that... Uh, it, pardon me. It's the kind of stuff that GitHub sort of tracks for you. Um, when will the assignments be released? Well, let's take a look. Next week. Assignment 1 will be released next week. And due July 19th. There you go. <clears throat> so, comment each function to indicate what its purpose is. This includes any assumptions about the inputs properties of the outputs, and invariants that will hold throughout execution. 
comment the end of each function with something like end of function x. This will make it much easier to navigate your code. So you're now in C programming land, OK? Ooh, you're now in C land. When you're at C, I'm just going to call it when you're at C. When you're at C, the functions that you write will very often be longer than your screen. Even if you have a separate monitor and you turn it vertical, your function will be longer than your screen is in a lot of cases. It's useful to comment end of function x at the end of a function because you can't see the top of it, right? So it's useful to know what function you're working on because one of the things that you'll be doing is scanning up and down your code looking for you know where to insert things and knowing what function is which is extremely useful. So, preprocessor directives. In Python, we access libraries using import. In C, we use include. Lines beginning with the octothorpe character are preprocessor directives. Preprocessor directives are processed before the program is parsed. So, .h files are known as header files. Many of C's most important libraries are stored in header files. stdio.h contains the definition for printf and much more besides. So, basically every single C program you're ever going to write or ever have written is likely going to need stdio.h because you're probably going to need printf at some point. Um, so yeah, adding this line to the top of each C program should become reflexive. As soon as you create a C program, include stdio.h. Ta-da! So, in Python, statement blocks are indicated using indentation. There we go. This is just a simple function that finds the max of two values. In C, statements, statement blocks are indicated using the curly braces. Curly braces. So you can see everywhere that Python uses a, uh, a colon to open a new statement block, we've got an opening, um, we've got opening curly brace. And wherever the, uh, wherever the function would have been ended in Python by uh, returning to a previous level of indentation, there we would put curly braces, the closing curly brace. So you can see Python code looks very much like C code, just without the, cur with the curly braces removed and colons instead. The levels of indentation are preserved. Um, the thing is, this is the only this is only the way that C is coded by convention. This is there's no actual syntactic requirement in the part on the part of C for your code to look like this, as we're gonna see in the next slide. One more thing, all C statements are semicolon terminated. Semicolon. Semicolon. All of them. So white space doesn't matter. This program is the same as this program. Actually, it's identical. From the perspective of the compiler, you cannot, the difference cannot be told between this one and this one. This one and this one. Clearly, one of these is preferable for humans, right? This one is very difficult to read. This one is much easier to read. So if you're formatting your code such that a human being should want to, should have to read it, including yourself, I would not recommend this as a style of coding. But from the compiler's perspective, there is literally no difference. Literally no difference. So the main event. In Python, execution begins at the first line of the script and terminates on the last line. In C, execution begins at the first line of the main function and terminates either when execution has reached a return statement inside of main or when the program reaches the last line in main. 
a main function is required for compilation. So if I were to take my example program here, call it something other than main, like hello, and I were attempt to compile that, error, LD returned one exit status, undefined reference to main. So we cannot compile a C program without main being in there. Uh, trying to put regular statements in the global namespace will result in syntax errors aplenty. So in Python, you can use this space here, right? You can use this space to do general programming. In C, if you try it, you will get, you know, int i is equal to zero, i plus plus, printf, um, i, there we go, there we go. Errors aplenty, ta-da. So that's not valid C construction. That's valid in Python, because Python's all loosey-goosey. Well, technically speaking, in Python, um, the entire file is main, right? So they, what they've done is, rather than have main and have execution start at main, they've just defined a Python file as being everything inside of main, basically. We'll talk about other C functions in excruciating depth in the next few weeks. <clears throat> also, the int keyword indicates that main returns an integer value. A return value of zero indicates that the program exited normally, i.e. without runtime errors. Any other return value typically indicates the program exited abnormally, i.e. errors happened. This is going to be more interesting once we, uh, once we learn how to do some shell scripting so that we can actually capture these return values of main functions from C programs and do stuff with them. Giving void as an argument indicates that this program is ignoring any past arguments. The void keyword may be omitted. So if you are taking arguments, if your C program run from the command line is taking arguments in the same way that you've seen GCC, uh, you'll have a couple of things here that we'll talk about later. But for now, we don't have to worry about so that, so let's just make it void. Can you define functions before main and call them in main, or is it better to run the, write the functions inside of main? It is preferable to... Um, it is preferable to write the functions outside of main and then call them inside of main. So, uh, with with C programming, you are you have to declare the function before it's used, right? So, if I return zero for this, just to get rid of the warning, if I take this guy and I put it down here and I try to compile, uh, warning implicit declaration of function f. So, what's interesting is that this f does not exist, right? But c is not going to assume that you did anything wrong. c is going to assume, oh, I probably just can't find the definition anywhere. I'm sure you wouldn't use something you haven't defined. I'm sure you wouldn't get things in the wrong order. So not, not having the function f available here to be run, that actually shows up as a runtime error, not a syntax error. So that's kind of the fun thing about C, is a lot of stuff that you would expect to be a syntax error actually shows up as a runtime error, which is why you always have to run your C programs after you've compiled them to make sure that you don't have anything like that. Simply compiling does not mean that it works. So, so yeah, um... You can write function, your functions inside of main. Oh, I should probably put this back to main. That'll probably help as well. Yeah. Um, so you can define these functions inside of the main namespace. However, if you defined it inside of main, like if you defined, um, you know, int q, you know, whatever, what would like what you would do 
is you would prevent any function other than main from accessing it, right? So, which is not necessarily what you want. So if you want other functions, if you want functions other than main to be able to call the function, it has to be defined outside of main. And in fact, I'm going to show you function prototypes very quickly. A way that you get away from, uh, around this is you provide what's called a function prototype. If you include a line at the top of the file declaring the function, uh, declaring the function, um, what its return type is, what its arguments are, you're saying this exists in here. If you do that, everything's fine. It's like, okay, so f exists. Okay, so I'll use f then, and I'll just, you know, I'll, uh, I'll, I, uh, if you use a function prototype, you can include the definition anywhere. And there's, this is an, so this is an interesting little thing as well. So uh, if you have um, void a calls b and void b calls a, right? If you have uh, this kind of circular reference, um, it's impossible for that to work unless um, unless you include the function prototypes. Void a, come on, void b. There we go. Hmm. Anyway, so um, so that's I think that's good. Oh yeah, okay. Uh, I'll I'll unless there are any more questions, I'll sign off here. Um, go get some lunch. Have fun with the have have fun with the lab. It's kind of like game oriented. Like it's there's there's a game involved. So have fun with the game. It's like a text based. Okay, I'll just tell you what the lab is. It's like um, it's like a text adventure, but you're learning uh, you're learning the basic terminal commands. Um, yeah, see, like, so this is like this is the kind of stuff that um, these are the reasons that I really like C. Um, it's a language for like nerds, like in in. The, most programming languages are for nerds, but C is like super, super for nerds because there are all these rules. <laughs> and it's like, <laughs> you know, if you don't know what you're doing, you can get yourself in a bit of a pickle. But uh, if you do know what you're doing, you can, you, can, you can program the beautiful, elegant music of the universe. Um, but yeah, anyway, I'll let you guys get some lunch. Doesn't seem like there are any questions.